Welcome to the University of Maine Alumni Achievement Awards. Honoring First Lieutenant Christina McTighe, Seth Albert, Jean Dean, Ernest Scheider, Barbara Brown Dalton, Dr. Paul Plord, The Stimson Family, Dr. Hemet Pensy, and Judge George Single. Our thanks to our award sponsors. Our media sponsors. And our event sponsor, the Jackson Laboratory. With more than 2,400 employees working toward one goal to discover precise genomic solutions for disease and empower the global biomedical community to our shared quest to improve human health. The Jackson Laboratory. Now, your host and a proud member of UMaine's class of 1994, J.C. Monahan. Hi everyone, I'm J.C. Monahan, UMaine class of 94, and I'm pleased to welcome you back to the College of Our Hearts Always. We have a fun-filled program to share with you today. Along with honoring this year's winners, we'll be hearing from several alums who will be sharing fond memories and some common threads that lead us back to our time at UMaine. But first, Christina McTighe is Vice President of the Class of 2012. Some of you may be familiar with her contributions to Maine Alumni Magazine, but this rising star is doing much more to make her alma mater proud. I'm Nate Wilds. Christina McTighe graduated with degrees in social work and psychology from the University of Maine in 2012 and hit the ground running. I met Christina in 2015. I was a program manager and I was on an interview panel uh, for hiring social workers to come on board and work with kids in foster care. I remember the interview like it was yesterday and was very impressed and knew that we would hire her and that she would be great as soon as she walked out the door. She is full of compassion and understanding and strives every day to make um, this world a little bit better for everyone that she loves. Working with Teach for America in Charlotte, North Carolina, earning her master's in clinical social work with a focus in mental health, and joining the Child and Family Services Agency in the District of Columbia. Some call her Christina, but to me, she's known as Chrissy. I will also tell you, I call her LBW, um, Little Baby Wisdom, because she is one of the um, smartest people I have met who is still figuring out her career. She feels very passionate about how things should be for people. And so she wants to ensure that the contribution she's making has a great return for as many people as possible. Lindsay Nix, Assistant Attorney General for the District of Columbia, worked with McTagg on complicated and challenging medical child abuse cases. I actually met Chrissy because she was interested in one of the cases that I had at the time. Some people would run from these cases and Chrissy stepped up to handle this case. The work that Chrissy and I did on this case set a precedent that future cases in DC must consider the ADA, and that was a win. When not helping shape law, McTighe rallied fellow UMaine alumni at events in our nation's capital. Today, colleagues at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base call Lieutenant Christina McTighe invaluable. She can help me navigate the kind of questions to ask and just getting at some of the things that are deeper that the patient might not want to talk about at first. To do what Lieutenant McTighe does, it takes the head and the heart and to be able to cradle somebody's baby that just died and just be there for, for the mom. That's the type of person that, that she is, um, the person that has heart for other people. Chrissy gets up in the morning to help people, and I know that sounds contrived, but it's true. Your work uh, is very meaningful. Uh, really, I, I know that the entire uh, Alumni Association is proud of what you've done uh, to support uh, children all around the country, the work that you've done, uh, and, and you know the, the focus that you've brought uh, to mental health. And so I applaud the University of Maine for whatever impact they had on Chrissy. She's a star as a person and a social worker. Chrissy's time at the University of Maine very much formed the parts of her that all of us um, are so grateful for. We need more Christina McTighe in, in our world. 
Christina McTighe, a tireless advocate and a rising star in UMaine's 2021 Alumni Achievement Awards. The first memory probably stands out most when you're driving up and you see the big M on the field house. Beautiful days out in the mall, people playing frisbee, studying, dogs out there, just smiling faces. It's always a beautiful place. Student government was was pretty awesome because it gets you involved in every element of the campus. And I spent most of my time in the student government office. One of my fondest of memories was Bumstock. Uh, because that was an outdoor festival that with music all day that just sticks in my mind as a memory of sunny spring day at Orono. I will never forget um, my first hockey game, of course, um, just because uh, being from Argentina, hockey is not something that's uh, readily available to us. So I remember walking into, into the arena and just looking around and seeing this crowd and, and it was a little chilly but it, it was comfortable and then seeing the, the game start and not really understanding what was going on but the minute that you main score the crowd just went crazy um, it, it was such a feeling that, that that's definitely one of uh, one of my my most memorable memories. Stop the presses. This black bear has been informing readers with his colorful black and white writing since we first saw his byline in the main campus. Today, Ernest Scheider, a member of the class of 2006, is receiving this year's Spirit of Maine Achievement Award. I'm Emily Kane. There are reporters, there are journalists, and there are storytellers. Janine Pinio remembers the main campus and then Bangor Daily News writer, who could be all three. He would come strolling into the newsroom um, and he'd sit down and he'd just get started working. He was so eager to learn and to grow as a journalist. Ernie's covered challenging stories, the Penn State abuse scandal, Sandy Hook, the 2020 presidential campaign, plus energy issues in North Dakota. You know, I didn't know him before I ran for the Senate in 2012. And all of a sudden we started getting calls from Reuters of all places. And it wasn't uh, in Houston. It wasn't, uh, you know, in exotic places. It was in Williston, North Dakota. So many journalists that I've worked with, they have the headline written, they have the lead written, and they just want you to confirm it. That wasn't his, his MO. I never worried about quoting any number in his news reports, because I knew they would be right. Ernie Scheider's immersive work impresses those he covers and his colleagues. He captures the essence of a story beyond just the facts. And a recent example is when he was in Arizona reporting on the, uh, the battle between an indigenous group and a mining company and, the, and the, over land rights. He will read books about the topic that he's going to write about. And this at a wire service is remarkable because we operate at a fast pace and we get stories out quickly. And it's a testament to the kind of journalist that he is. When he's not running down a story, Ernie is often running. At the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, we consider Ernie kind of the mayor of our marathon team. Ernie became involved with the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation after he found out his grandfather had Alzheimer's. So he decided the way he was going to raise money, he was going to run marathons. And to date, he's raised over $20,000 to fund science looking for preventions, treatments, and cures of Alzheimer's. Those who know him trace his character back to his home state. It's the spirit of Maine. It's excellence. The passion, the optimism, the get to itness. Kind, you're empathetic. You're incredibly intelligent and something that we desperately need. Somebody who just is so careful about reporting the facts. Ernie Scheider, a reporter, a journalist, a storyteller, and our Spirit of Maine Achievement Award winner. My favorite activity was the radio station because I was a disc jockey from all four years. Women's club lacrosse team. Student government um, in Los Colores Unidos. Golf, being on the golf team. I love exploring the humane trails. I know that there are miles and miles of trails and 
I've always liked biking and I've always liked just exploring in the woods. I used to love to run. So uh, the forest, you know, the trail system at Maine, it was really just, I think, an incredible asset for the university, still is. My favorite co-curricular activity has to be the Student Alumni Ambassadors. Participated all the years I was there on the Maine Woodsman's team. I was involved in helping one of the students become mayor of the campus for a year. And that was, uh, that was kind of fun to do. Um, we only had Memorial Gym as a convening place and um, concert series. So I remember distinctly that was where I first saw live Louis Armstrong. Once every four years, we would go to Europe for two weeks and sing in some of the great cathedrals like Notre Dame. And every four years, we'd sing in Carnegie Hall in New York City with a professional orchestra. There is one among this year's winners who may not be a black bear, but for years has worked to make UMaine an even better place, advising, counseling, and championing our campus and our community. Our champion of UMaine Award recipient is Jean Dean. I'm Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, Lee Softly. Here at the Zillman Art Museum, we're very fortunate we have Warhols, we have Picassos, and we have Jean Dean. The museum combines two of Jean's passions. Uh, certainly for the arts. She herself is an artist. And um, of course, she's a champion of Bangor as well. Many have enjoyed free admission to the museum thanks to Jean. And soon, visitors will see even more. We are building five new galleries uh, upstairs on the main level. And we're very pleased that we will have a Dean Porter gallery at the museum that people would be able to, to tour and enjoy the art in that gallery. She is a champion for me because she has spent a good deal of time mentoring me and helping me along as, as I've uh, transitioned into to owning her, her great business. Jean handed the reins of her business to Esther Brooke, Jennifer Butler, and Jennifer Eastman in 2019. Don't let looks deceive you. Jean is not very tall, but she is mighty. She is a force to be reckoned with on many fronts. You can't say no to Jean, and, the, and you don't want to say no. I went to my sister's inauguration, and she grabbed me and said, you and I have got to do something about the law school. That conversation sparked a rejuvenation of the University of Maine School of Law, firming up its foundation and, some say, returning it to its rightful place among national schools of law. Jeannie's a champion of the law school because it basically gave her the bedrock of analytical skills and uh, the thought process and the understanding of due process of law. Jean's personality, intellect, and consistent unwillingness to settle for anything less than excellence have made her an outstanding advocate for the university and the arts. She's one of those people uh, who understands fully what her civic role is. She might not be a true black bear, but she has the heart of a black bear. And Jean's heart is shaped like the state of Maine, and she just pours her love and everything she has into the state. And so, that, I mean, that's why she's a very good ambassador for both the university itself, also for the law school and the entire system that she's she was raised by, really. Congratulations, Jean, on winning this award. What award is this? She wins so many. Jean, Warren and I want to congratulate you on all you have done for the Zillman Art Museum, on all you have done for Bangor and the University of Maine. There are all kinds of people that are championing the uh, University of Maine, and that's because that's what the university does. It generates champions, but boy, you're one of the bigger ones. All of us are so blessed to have Jean Dean as our champion. Jeannie, we have a beautiful home, a beautiful marriage, a beautiful life together. You are my champion. Jean Dean, 
a champion of arts and humanities, and our Champion of UMaine Award recipient. In February, the world lost one of the influential black bears of all time. Reflecting on this memorable alumnus, here's the president and CEO of our UMaine Alumni Association, John Diamond. Dr. Bernard Lowne passed away just a few months short of his 100th birthday. He was many things, a renowned cardiologist, the inventor of the heart defibrillator, the machine that has saved countless lives throughout the world, the co-recipient of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize, and a 1942 graduate of the University of Maine. Dr. Lowne was born in Lithuania but emigrated with his family to Lewiston, Maine when he was 14. After completing his UMaine degree, he earned a medical degree from Johns Hopkins University and embarked on a world-changing career. He devoted his life to the advancement of human health and nuclear disarmament. He saw these causes as interrelated. He explained it this way. He said, you cannot be committed to health without being engaged in the social struggle for health. He was proud of his status as a UMaine alumnus, and UMaine was, and is, proud of him. In 1982, he received an honorary degree from the university, and in 1988, he was the inaugural recipient of the Alumni Association's Dr. Bernard Lowne Humanitarian Award. The award is given to UMaine graduates who have been actively engaged at the regional national or global level in saving lives, relieving suffering, and promoting human dignity. A fitting tribute and legacy for someone whose influence on the world is immeasurable. We are so grateful for his extraordinary life. Today, hundreds of thousands of people are living better lives thanks to the work of Dr. Paul Plourd. His medical, clinical, and scientific skills led to breakthroughs in battling cancer in young children and in women. The recipient of this year's Dr. Bernard Lowne Humanitarian Award is Dr. Paul Plourd. I'm Dr. Bruce Levitt. Dr. Paul Plourd may be best described as a clinical investigator. With your help, we can improve the quality of life for American women and their families. Thank you. Colleagues call Dr. Plourd's contributions to novel hormonal treatments of breast cancer unparalleled. For those who have advanced breast cancer, incurable, you'd like to develop therapies to make them live longer and better. For those patients with curative cancer, you like to develop therapies to decrease the likelihood of it ever coming back. And ultimately, you like to develop therapies for, for preventing cancer from occurring in the first place. Paul's triumphs were in all three potential goals for the development of an anti-cancer drug for breast cancer. He was instrumental in developing anastrozole. And when we have new possibilities, in both medicine and medical devices, and what we want to do is get those to people as quickly as possible. Just and as so the Clinton administration sought to accelerate FDA approval of safe and efficacious drugs. Well, Dr. Plourd knew about that. And so when he heard that, he submitted the application for approval of anastrozole right away. Most drugs take at least two or three years, and the drug was approved in 43 days. Anastrozole really became the treatment for hormone-dependent breast cancer. The Federal Food and Drug Administration recently approved a new drug to treat breast cancer. The new drug is considered a breakthrough for women who have advanced breast cancer. That offers quality of life to these women, which uh, in previous years they did not have with these drugs. So this is an advance uh, for women with advanced breast cancer. Dr. Plourd also helped bring a life-saving drug to American children. You know, childhood leukemia was, um, was a death sentence for young children for a long time until chemotherapy came around that literally converted a death sentence to a, um, to a cure. Many children developed an allergy to treatment, but Erwin Ozzy, developed in Europe from a different microorganism, could safely treat children with the allergy. 
Plore joined EUSA Pharmacy to bring Aeronaza to the United States. And one of the most attractive things about Paul in, in, in that interview was how much he cared about the idea that, that this was a very important medicine that would really help children in, in, in the U.S. EUSA launched a program to deliver the treatment to patients on a compassionate basis. Over the course of about four years, we treated just short of 1,400 patients. That's quite a lot of people to benefit, isn't it? That's kind of like one a day. Um, and there aren't many doctors who can say that they've, they've given a life, potentially life-saving cure to one patient a day for every day of four years. Ordinarily, someone that works for a pharmaceutical company, it's a very much top-down organization. And there's not a lot of individual innovation where an individual with vision can put forward, forward their idea in a large organization and have that come out and be accomplished. Paul did that. He has a broad compassion for patients and it's underpinned by um, a very scientific brain, actually. His scope uh, of impact has been really rather dramatic from breast cancer and different forms of breast cancer um, to childhood cancers. Uh, it's been really quite dramatic. Over the last 20 years, progressive stages of treatment have occurred to the point uh, that women with very early disease are being treated. And that's very exciting because a significant number of women now uh, will be cured of their disease with surgery and with tamoxifen. Dr. Plord, you don't know me, but I know you. My name is Jenny Lloyd and I'm a breast cancer survivor. My job, my joy, is to guide women and men to the support and care they need at Northern Light Cancer Care. On behalf of the hundreds and thousands of patients living and living better lives, thank you. Dr. Paul Plord, a saver of hundreds of thousands of lives and recipient of our Bernard Lown Humanitarian Award. Native American Studies 101 and 102 with John Bear Mitchell. Investment Strategy with Dr. Bob Strong. It's probably dynamics uh, and or hydrology. Uh, human resource management. Uh, and it was taught by Sheila Pachinski. Journalism, law, and ethics with a professor named Bob Steele. I liked anything with Rosemary Bamford. So Lisi, we started every class with a dance. Favorite course that I took was one, I can't remember the exact title, but it was communication law. And I really enjoyed it because it helped me to think strategically about the way that companies handle PR issues. Comparative anatomy, where we looked at different different um, you know animals and their different anatomies and you know we dissected you know a shark and a cat and obviously became a surgeon later in life so a really tough one i think i really enjoyed um early colonial american history with professor reardon on campus um we're kind of taught this idea of what the american revolution was from a very pro-american standpoint but Looking at the American Revolution from a globalist perspective really puts into perspective the, the global impact of the founding of America and our country. So he did a great job. Star Shine and Guide. Seth Alberta, third generation black bear, started shining and guiding long before he set foot on campus. Today, he's vice president of our UMaine alumni chapter in Southern Maine, and he's an alumni association rising star. I'm Jenny Desmond. Seth Albert's community spirit started stirring long ago. His mother recalls when, shortly after getting his driver's license, Seth walked out of the house, hopped in his car, and took off down the road. And so we were watching public TV, and all of a sudden I recognized this voice. My son's on TV. 
and he was advocating for the school budget at 16 years old. He was really challenging the school board and saying, you really need to keep these programs in place. Seth continues that community spirit, working with UMA CSM, rallying black bears in the University of Maine alumni chapter of Southern Maine. Seth has been very active with the group. He has been active in a mentor role, and he's just had a lot of great ideas for the group. On top of that, Seth is, is very involved in UMaine hockey. It's, uh, it's one of his big loves. He was a, a member of the Naked Five a couple of times. He actually met his wife uh, at a UMaine hockey trip. Seth's love for UMaine hockey took him to Ireland to watch his team compete. At the end of the day, went to a pub, met his future wife, who had done the same, taken her mother and gone to a UMaine hockey game in Ireland. And they are now Mr. and Mrs. Seth, congratulations. You're a black bear through and through, and we are really lucky to have you help steering the ship and the future of you, Maxim. Congrats. Seth, congrats on the Rising Star Award from UMaine. There are a lot of stars coming out of UMaine, and you are certainly one of them. Way to go, bud. There's a song that I've always loved, and it resonates with me deep. And it's called Humble and Kind by Tim McGraw. And it just describes Seth to a T. Seth Albert, shining, guiding, and receiving the UMaine Alumni Rising Star Award. I think that Maine Day was one of those things that everyone on campus always got so excited about. Maine Day all, um, all the years. Um, it's definitely fun and it's a time when you can see the person that you kind of forgot about who you sat next to your freshman year and all of a sudden you're, you're talking to them. And um, yeah, it's just a great uh, opportunity to reconnect with people um, and to you know, hang out with your close friends as well. The Daily Main Campus, uh, being involved in that on that staff, really, that was a, a really big part of particularly my uh, junior and senior years. And it gave me practical experience in journalism, which I turned into my first job. Took our freshly minted concrete toboggan to Henniker, New Hampshire, and entered the New England World Championship downhill concrete toboggan race. My, my best memories actually uh, come from my volunteer uh, work after I graduated. And uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, I chaired the uh, University of Maine Foundation a couple of terms. I served on the uh, University of Maine Alumni Association board. I, uh, probably by virtue of the fact that I chaired the, uh, also the President's Development Council. A few months ago, our UMaine alumni community lost one of its most active volunteers. Here to reflect on her contributions are Chair of the Alumni Association's Board of Directors, Rob Frank, and the Board's Vice Chair, Kristen McAlpine. Suzanne K. Hart was a member of the class of 1968 and a longtime member and officer of the Alumni Association's Board of Directors. In fact, she served a total of 17 years on the board, which could be a modern day record. Suzanne was a true leader. She held the offices of chair, vice chair, and treasurer over the course of her board service. And she never stopped advocating for the university and the Alumni Association. Suzanne believed in the value and importance of an independent, self-governing alumni association. She felt it was the best model for serving the interests of Black Bear alumni while also providing meaningful, third-party support for the university itself. The Alumni Association was a family affair for Suzanne. She was a third-generation UMaine graduate and a second-generation member of the association's board of directors. In December, our board decided to posthumously honor Suzanne. We renamed our annual Alumni Service Award after her. What had been known as the Pine Tree Emblem Alumni Service Award is now called the Suzanne K. Hart Alumni Service Award. It's the top honor we can give to someone who dedicates extraordinary time and talent on behalf of Black Bear alumni. It makes perfect sense that such an award be named after someone who, as a volunteer, works so enthusiastically and diligently to promote the university's values and tradition. Here's to Suzanne.
And here's to our first Suzanne K. Hart Alumni Service Award winner. A friend to Suzanne and a friend to you, Maine, Barb Brown Dalton has been a tireless advocate for her community, her college, and the class of 81. And Barb is far from done. I'm Bill Green. Who better to tell us about Barb Brown Dalton than her black bear husband? Barb is uh, quite a woman. She's a driven person. She's pretty sure of herself and sure of what I'll do as well. <laughs> That's how she rolls. She rarely sits still. If she does, it's not for more than 15 or 20 minutes. And Barb's energy is certainly infectious. You can tell she cares a lot about her job, her, her university, her husband, her dog, her house. Um, anything you're talking to Barb about, um, there's a genuine excitement uh, passion and, and love. Barb's passion for all she does is easily traced to her dad. If you look at the passion that Barb brings brings to everything she does, it's, it's no doubt emulating that which she learned from her father. Francis Brown was a diehard black bear and he instilled that in both of his children, uh, Barb and Kathy, her sister. Todd Saucier served on the UMaine Alumni Board with Barb and recalls those <laughs> early morning meetings. I don't think there was ever an occasion that Barb either walked in last or perhaps got there just in time, but always, always made mention, I can't believe we start these things before 10 o'clock in the morning. More than a fan, Barb is a humane fanatic. Barb loves athletics. We are longtime season ticket holders to humane hockey, women's basketball, and more recently, men's basketball. You'd be hard pressed to find a bigger cheerleader for UMaine Athletics than Barb. Um, she's at our games, she's a tremendous fan, and then outside of that, she's a tremendous volunteer and community supporter of Black Bear Athletics. And she certainly supported Black Bear Athletics Super Suppers. She would spend four, five, six months talking to every client she ever had, anybody that she ever met at a you know, a Black Bear athletic event, anybody that she ever knew. And then she picked the brains of those of us that knew others. And she was asking unabashedly for whatever you had for wares or services. And those would go into these live auctions. You know, and these suppers would raise north of $20,000 because of Barb Dalton's work. Barb and Bill Dalton were close friends and neighbors to Suzanne K. Hart. I first met Barb when I joined the alumni board and Suzanne Hart was the chair. I got to learn how much that they meant to each other. Barb and, and Suzanne really knitted the, the, and completed each other in so many ways. Amongst a few others, Barb was the, the go-to gal uh, for Suzanne's care as things became more challenging in, in Suzanne's life. She became her, her person. And I know Barb must be very, very moved to receive this award, named after her close friend, Suzanne Hart. Barb Brown Dalton, a faithful friend, a faithful fan, and the recipient of the first Suzanne K. Hart Alumni Service Award. The people you meet at college are your friends forever. My friend Meryl McClellan, um, she and I are still really close to this day. Jeff Harris uh, was uh, very influential for me. Aaron and David Dempsey, good friends from those first years. John Diamond, because uh, I learned about wit was more important than wisdom. I don't know what made me think of that. I have a lot of good friends from the University of Maine that I met there. Um, my best friend, who I'm still friends with, she lives in Wyndham, uh, Shannon Trainer. We met the first day of field hockey preseason. We immediately hit it off and we've been friends ever since. A guy named Terry Philbrook, he was an RA in my dorm. And um, over the years, I became close to him and his family. He, uh, he got married after we left college. He was a year ahead of me and his, I got to know his children and his children are now, you know, they call me Uncle Chuck. They're the only people in the world who call me Chuck. Part of the fun of my job as the director of the Maine Forest Products Council is that I get to see old classmates and roommates who graduated uh, from Maine and uh, majored in forestry or virtually any other 
if they're in policy and in state government or in the industry, um, there's a strong network of people that stay together and connect and reminisce. A group of wolves is a pack, a group of geese is a gaggle, a group of bears is a sleuth or a sloth. Interesting, right? Did you know? Well, for this year's Vulgar Legacy Award, we'll call this group of humane black bears the Stimson family. Helping to share their story is the great-granddaughter of Raymond Folger himself. I'm Crystal Fogler Laviger. Tracing the Stimson family back to its first black bear takes us back about a century. My grandfather started at UMO in the 20s, and he was Clifford Leslie Stimson. My father, his son, also went, and he went in 1955 to the University of Maine at Orono. He was a busy man, but he loved every minute of it. Yes. And he was, a, he was a wonderful teacher and wonderful speaker. Don and Rita Stimson were pleased to see not only daughter Leslie off to Orono. I went in 1980. My brother went two years later. My grandfather went there, my father went there, and my father was actually a professor there. And best of all, I, I married a, a, a black bear. Today, Scott and Lori Stimson's son, Dylan, helps represent the family's fourth generation at UMaine. I was a black bear long before I enrolled at the University of Maine. I was rocking the black bear sweatshirts when I was literally a baby. And my dad would like take us to a black bear hockey games. Not only is our son Dylan at the University of Maine, our son Tyler graduated in psychology from there. Dylan, a UMaine baseball standout, says he wasn't expected to come to Maine. Rather, he anticipated it. Dad didn't pressure me to go to Maine at all. It was kind of just something that when I got to be that age, I was like, okay, this seems like the right choice and the right thing to do. It's almost like I didn't choose you, Maine. You, Maine, really chose me. I think that's true for me as well, because the first time I went down to see it, even though all my friends were there, if it had been a terrible fit, I wouldn't have gone. And it did, it picked me. I felt the same when I went to the University of Maine. As did I, with the, you know, we made the right decision, been happy ever since. Do the Stimpsons find you, Maine, today to feel foreign or familiar? I really haven't been back that much, to be honest, just a few times, maybe for a few hockey games. It is familiar, I think it's more familiar than foreign to me, even though some of the things have changed. What I liked most about the University of Maine when I went there was the Bears Den. <laughs> I also remember um, Alphon Arena, because we used to go to go to uh, Black Bear hockey games with my dad. People are so nice and easy to, to meet and to and, and they're kind, and I felt like it's really a homey aspect. And I think I really like the outdoors aspect. I like walking on campus and seeing like a type of uh, a type of campus that isn't like uh, any other campus I've been to. And what of a fifth generation? I am going to have kids someday, and hopefully one of my kids will be playing baseball at the University of Maine as well. Music to our ears, and speaking of music, Hey, is that a piano in Dylan's room? Yeah, yeah. have you played the main Stein song? I'm sorry, play one of the what? The main Stein song. I don't know that. He doesn't know? The main Stein song? Oh, the embarrassment. I'm very good, but I don't know that one. How can you be a black bear and not know the Stein song? Ugh. I don't know the Stein song, but I can play some Beethoven. Maybe the fifth generation will know it. Maybe. The Stimson family, chosen by Maine and chosen for this year's Fogler Legacy Award. I credit the University of Maine with my very existence because my parents met on campus. We actually met at music camp, Maine Summer Youth Music. <laughs> we were both teaching at music camp. With Bumstock 1991, um, that is, that's um, when we were, became officially a bear pair. Um, all Bumstocks were great, but that one was particularly fun. Nancy Fogler Strout is, uh, is my wife and uh, we met, she was a forestry major. And uh, we met in at Nutting Hall. 
Uh, I met Kyle when um, when we, I, I, him and I were both having lunch at the student center at the, the union, and uh, and one conversation just led to a date, and from then on we uh, we've been together now for over 13 years. He was at my door and I was down the hall and someone said, hey, Carl Smith's at your door. And so he asked me out that night on our first date. And then our first date was on the night that I turned 18. So that was fun. Um, and I remember the Olympics were on too. So we went back and watched that. Um, and now we've been together 26 years. So met my wife, who it'll be 39 years um, uh, on a blind date at a party that I hosted at the frat house and had no date, so she became my date and now we're married 39 years. The selection criteria to earn our next award is rigorous, only by meeting the University of Maine's land-grant tradition of teaching, research, and public service might one earn the Distinguished Maine Professor Award. Before we meet this year's recipient, let's learn more about the award. Hello everyone, I'm Samantha Lothale. In the early 1960s, the late Mike Roy and other members of the class of 1942 established an endowment fund to annually honor a member of the UMaine faculty. Mike and his classmates did not want this to be just any award. They wanted it to be the most prestigious award a UMaine faculty member could receive. So they created an endowment fund and built it up to the point where each year, the distinguished Maine professor honoree receives a check for $4,200, a nod to the class of 42. Nine years ago, Mike Roy and his remaining classmates passed the torch to my class, the class of 2002, and asked us to take responsibility for keeping the endowment fund well-fueled. The Alumni Association has also taken a financial interest in making sure that the distinguished Maine professor honorees, past and present, are celebrated for the roles they have played in elevating the University of Maine's quality, value, and reputation. On behalf of the class of 2002, and in honor of the class of 1942, it's my pleasure to congratulate the 2021 Distinguished Maine Professor. I'm Senator Susan Collins. Students, colleagues, friends, and even families say that you might not see Hemet Penze's passion when simply talking with him. But it's really strong. Like there's a deep abiding care there for the students, for the university, and for the larger community as well. Barbara Hamilton recalls Professor Penze as an engaging, enlightening instructor. Very organized, very clear, very able to communicate these difficult concepts to young students. I also remember that Dr. Penze is, uh, has the distinction of giving me my first B in a college class. He is very convincing as a, as a teacher. He emphasizes the right advantages and gets the uh, enough excitement. He has a vision. He knows what's needed. He is a great teacher and instructor, but he's so much more than that. James Beaupre admits, as many do, to being at first intimidated by Hemet. He's a mentor. He's a guide. He's going to challenge students and help them grow and form to be things that are greater than they could ever even imagine, to make massive impacts just like he does. I found out if you get five minutes, he's a helpful guy. Really friendly, really neat, but getting that five minutes is tough to come by. He's a busy guy, but the key is, if you need him, he will make time for you. He is chair of an important department. Uh, he has taken and transformed what was really agricultural engineering through a complete transformation to biomedical engineering. And he runs the Forest Bioproducts Research Institute. When Hemet is at the Forest Bioproducts Research Institute, he is half mad scientist, if you will, and half salesperson. 
FBRI recognizes that oil comes from decayed organic material buried in the ground for hundreds of millions of years. What Hammett has been able to do is to take out the hundreds of millions of years. Basically, take that natural organic material and turn it to th into things that we as a society desperately need. Today, Hammett and his teams are turning wood into jet fuel, literally shifting paradigms in how we power our world. It took us hundreds of years to get where we are now. It's going to take an extended period of time to get where we need to be, but Dr. Pensy's work is key to taking and moving us all in this direction. Hammett also moves at the speed of business. Businesses often move at a much quicker pace than academia. That's just a fact. But Hemet knows that in order to talk to businesses and to work with them and collaborate with them, he has to move at that speed as well, and he's excellent at that. I know that not every dad can balance work and family, but my dad, he can. Hemet's daughter says his heart is on his family, even as his mind is on his work. He always has his work iPhone, he's always you know, reachable. He's always thinking about work, even when we're on vacation or on the weekends or at the camp. Well, I actually um, have fond memories of going to the Jeunesse Hall barbecues that they had. He's really melded our family with the Jeunesse Hall family, and it's just something that he's really made a priority. When I think of all the engineers that have come from this university and all that they've accomplished for the community, the state, in this country, it's impressive. WBRC is privileged to sponsor this award for Hemet Pence, and let me tell you why. Many of our engineers working with Hemet on the design of the new Engineering and Design Center were his students. Hemet doesn't want to just make things happen. He wants to make big things happen. He's really good at selling the state of Maine, what the university can do, what our forest economy, what our forest industry in the state um, can become. He really wants the world to be a better place. Congrats, Dad, on being named the Distinguished Maine Professor. We're all so proud of you. You have been a great colleague for more than three decades. It has been an honor to work with you. And you're probably the best guide and light that we've had in a long time in this institution to be a leader, to be a difference maker. To see that your efforts and your um, passion has culminated in this award, um, I think is, is really awesome. It's a crowning achievement. I'm so happy you got it. And uh, it's so well deserved. And I don't think distinguished even begins to get at what you have contributed to the university and to the state of Maine. And, and I forgive you for, for giving me a B in my first college class. <laughs> Hemet Penzik, an inspiring, visionary entrepreneur and educator, and our 2021 Distinguished Maine Professor. Say Dana Humphrey and Habib Dogger. It was Dr. McClure for sure. I'm Dr. Nicholas Earhart, he was my honors thesis advisor. Dr. Bill Small, who was a, a professor of German. Coach Cosgrove was definitely instrumental uh, for me in my development. I was really impressed with the political science faculty, specifically um, Professor Madigan and Professor La Rochelle, and how and how they kind of like discuss American politics and the blunt reality of how they work. Uh, professor Steele was. Um, he was in journalism and he taught journalism, law and ethics. He taught senior seminar. He had practical experience, but he also was a really thoughtful guy and uh, somebody I've been in touch with since um, since being at UMaine. I was a political science major. Um, I would say that uh, Ken Hayes, who was a, uh, uh, one of the fellows who um, who taught state and local government at the time, made a, a tremendous difference in my life and my career choices. Dr. Pinto, um, I liked it because he uh, challenged me. Um, I, I failed uh, one of his first tests that I took with him and um, he, uh, he really held me accountable for, um, you know, to be well respected in his classroom.
The Alumni Career Award is the association's highest honor. It acknowledges the life's work of graduates who have proven themselves to be outstanding in areas of professional, business, civic, and or public service. Judge George Single proves to us that with education and dedication, anyone can achieve most anything in America. I'm NPR Washington correspondent Brian Naylor. George Singles' story begins in Lublin, Poland. His uh, father and mother, when the Nazis invaded Poland, fought in the resistance. His father did not survive the war. His mother was pregnant with George. And after the war, she took her little daughter by her hand and somehow, through courage and perseverance, found her way a thousand miles through Central Europe, over the Italian Alps, into a refugee camp where she gave birth to George. George's mother, his sister, and he, as a baby, emigrated to the United States. They had nothing, spoke little or no English, came to Bangor, Maine. George learned early on the value of education, the value of community, the value of hard work. He might have learned the value of luck when meeting the love of his life. I met George at Camp Lown in Oakland, Maine. I was in my cabin and I was attacked by a bat. This huge, huge thing came flying at me. I ran running out and he said, I'll get whatever it is. He comes in, he finds a broom, he goes bang, 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 bang. He comes out holding this little thing. And I say, that's not what I saw. <laughs> Single earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Maine in 1967, his Juris Doctor from Harvard in 1970, and then began private practice in Bangor. Every case that George took on, no matter what it involved, uh, was became a passion of George's, not just represent the, the client, but the knowledge base itself. Single soon became a lawyer's lawyer. And the proof of that is that when lawyers got into legal trouble, when they were sued for malpractice, who did they go to? They went to George Single. In 2000, President Clinton nominated Single to fill the post left by the passing of U.S. District Judge Morton Brody. He was a favored selection for the court, supported by me and many of his colleagues, our colleagues. I think uh, he had a quiet ambition to be a judge, and uh, he didn't go out and seek it actively, but he was delighted to have the appointment. And it's certainly true that he has served the court very well. When he goes on the bench to consider a case, he's known among his colleagues to be thoroughly prepared, to know the ins and outs of the case, to know the facts that gave rise to the case, and to understand fully what the policy ramifications are of his decisions. Chief Justice John Roberts appointed Single to the United States Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in 2019. For many of us, concepts of due process, separation of powers, freedom of speech are theoretical concepts. For George, they are secular commandments. They are concrete. Single would often share his inspirational story when naturalizing citizens. I wish everybody could observe Judge Single preside over a naturalization ceremony. He shares with them, in part, some of his personal history. And he inspires each and every one of those new citizens to achieve whatever they want. He does not tire of telling his story to new citizens to prove to them that in this country, anybody can be anything that they would hope. George is a talented cook who can tell a perfect joke. He can recite episodes of Seinfeld and The Godfather perfectly. And he always gets to the airport at least an hour ahead of when he needs to be. 
punctual in getting to an appointment and sitting for a portrait. One day I walked into uh, Judge Singles Chambers and he looked at me and he said, what are you going to do about your portrait? And I said, I, I don't know, I'm not quite ready for it. He said, you've got to do it now. Do it before your face sags. I called the artist that afternoon. <laughs> George is more than George. George is a patriot and he's somebody that it's a delight to know. George, you're not a person who seeks recognition, who seeks publicity. By nature, you are a quiet, reserved man. I am so happy for you and your family. George, uh, on behalf of me and Patty and our family, we want to congratulate you and tell you how very, very proud we are of you. My friend, my colleague, my mentor, the University of Maine has recognized your sustained excellence as a lawyer, as a judge, and as a human being. On behalf of all of the law clerks who've been lucky enough to work with you during your more than 20 years on the bench, we just want to thank you for your example. We've learned how to be students of the law while teaching others to appreciate the rule of law. Congratulations, Grandpa. Jake, Olivia, Zach, and I are so proud of you. We're always here cheering you on, and we can't wait to see what you accomplish next. We love you. I've grown up with you. I've raised our family together with you, and now I'm growing older with you. I am so proud of you today and always. Our entire family congratulates you on having received the 2021 University Alumni Career Award. It's so well-deserved, and especially so since I know how much the university has meant to you. Judge George Single the 2021 Alumni Career Award honoree. So ends our UMaine Alumni Association Achievement Awards to this year's winners, our rising stars, our dedicated storyteller, our champion of the arts and humanities, a saver of lives, a faithful fan and friend, a family chosen by Maine, a visionary educator, and Judge George Single, congratulations. I'm JC Monahan from the College of Our Hearts Always. Thank you for watching and for supporting you, May. Good night. All fill the signs to hear all May. Shout till the rafters ring. Stand and drink a toast once again. Let every loyal rain band sing and drink. To all the happy hours, be a drink to the careless days. Drink to me and all the mother, the college of our hearts always. To the trees, to the skies, to the spring and its glorious happiness, to the earth, to the fire, to the light that is moving and calling us, to the gods, to the fates, to the rules of men and their destinies, to the lips, to the eyes, to the world of love and day. Signs of dear old men, shout till the rafters ring. Stand and drink a toast once again. Let every 